Hello, we're starting a new series of small group of lessons called Fractured. And what we want to look at over the next five weeks is different uh, behaviors, different sins that can creep into a relationship and cause a lot of problems. So specifically, looking at greed, pride, lust, uh, bad communication, and, and uh, unforgiveness. We want to talk about how those things can creep into a relationship and they can wreck it, whether it be a marriage or a parent-child thing, a co-worker relationship, or even some relationships you might run into at church. We believe the Bible offers us some, some sound wisdom about how to approach these kinds of issues and how to get around them in a way that, uh, that is healthy and, and through Christ and in Christ, uh, life-giving, uh, life-bringing. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Greed is the first one. I have at different times had to talk to people about the issues they're going through. And, and most of these other issues that we're talking about in this series, I've had to talk to people about. They've come to me, they realize it's a problem, and they'll say, hey, I, I don't know what to do. We've got, got this thing going on, and now my wife and I, or my kids and I, or, or my coworkers and I, or these people at church and I, or, or whoever else, we just can't seem to get along any longer. And, and, it, and it's the stuff you would, you would imagine. I mean, it, it's, uh, 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 there's been another person creep into the relationship, or, or there's some dishonesty, you know, there's some anger, there's um, some, some, some bad communication uh, uh, that has went on for years and years and years. You know, some, some bad influences crept into, or, and unforgiveness. I've even had people admit some things like lust or pride, which, which are pretty personal, and it's hard to talk about them openly and honestly without revealing probably more about yourself than you wish you did. But, but I've never, in all the time that I've been involved in ministry, had someone come to me and say, I really struggle with, uh, with greed. And it's curious to me. I mean, if you think about it, with all the different things that go on, and with as much as greed is talked about in the New Testament, you'd think that sooner or later I would run across at least one greedy person. But so far, uh, I've been in ministry since 1991, and, and I've not. And there's a whole bunch of possible reasons why that is. It, it may be that I, I hang out with just a generous crowd. You know, the people I hang out with just don't struggle with that like, like other weaker mortals would. It is possible uh, that, it, it, that, that people don't want to bring that one up because they know what the solution would probably be, what I would probably say they should do to help get through it, and they don't want to hear it. But, but you know, you could say that about anything. Right? I mean, if a person struggled with, with drink, for instance, probably what I would tell them is, hey, you shouldn't do that as much. You know, hey, try not to go to the bar as often. Right? I mean, what you're going to tell anybody with anything they struggle with is, hey, maybe you shouldn't do as much of it. And, and um, so I don't think it's just that. I, I, I think it's probably more likely that greed is just sneaky. You, you don't see it, you know. It can get into your life and you just don't notice that you're struggling with it until it's been in there for quite a long time and, and, and maybe caused some damage. Greed uh, and, and money fights and money arguments uh, can break a marriage, uh, can wreck a person's relationship with their children or their parents or their co-workers, and even can creep into a church and, and can guide a church in, in bad directions. A person can base their friendships based on someone else's money or, or lack thereof. I mean, the money has a way of creeping into every part of our lives. But the Bible does offer some wisdom, and I just want to focus on a couple of verses, all out of uh, uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 8, Paul says to Timothy that godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we can be content with that. And, and, and this, this word content, and, and it gets popped up here again, uh, uh, just means uh, mostly independent. I mean, you could read it like independent. Uh, uh, I don't need anything else, you know? And, and at some level, you could make the argument that the rich man, the, the truly rich man, is someone who doesn't need anything. And they're, and they're content. They're, 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 they're self-sufficient. They don't, they don't need uh, another 10,000. They don't need another million. They don't need a bigger house. They don't need a faster car. They've gotten to the place where they're no longer really in need. And most people that you'd run across would say they're not in need, but that's not really how they operate, and that's not really how they live. They're always thinking about this next thing they ought to have or this next thing that they really want or this next thing that they, they believe they ought to have to really get happy. And, of course, we can't find happiness that way. Paul says the secret is godliness with contentment. That's real gain. When you and God are in good place and, and you're not... Uh, you're not distracted. And, and on these three verses here, ch uh, chapter 6, verse 68, describe a certain kind of person, right? I mean, they're, they're at peace. 
They're at peace. And, and they may be rich or poor. You, you know, you can be rich and content or rich and discontent or poor and content and poor and discontent. You know, contentment and your riches aren't necessarily tied uh, together, though, though, though they often are. But not all the time. Not all the time. And a person might have some money, but they're content. They're, 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 they're easily generous. They're easy to, to share. And that's one kind of person. On the other hand, he says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that can plunge people into ruin and destruction. This is a different word than the word used for baptism all the time, but it's interesting uh, placed in here. It, it, it immerses you into a whole different place you don't want to be. You can get so caught up about money and money concerns that if you don't watch out, that can start to steer your life. And he talks about into ruin and, and destruction. The King James would say perdition, uh, which is a harder, uglier word, and, and, and it implies damnation, right? I mean, if you don't watch out... This hunger for material stuff right here is going to take you someplace bad. And it really is just here. He says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Right? Now, he doesn't say that money in and of itself is the root, but, I mean, it, it, but, but the love of money. And not that money is the root of every possible evil, but just all kinds. Right? And, and, and there are people who could read that and say, well, there you go. There you go, I've got money, but I don't love it, so therefore, I'm all right, right? And, and again, it goes back to what I said before. I've never known anybody who said, yeah, greed's my main problem. I just think it's sneaky, and you don't want to walk too far away from the, 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 the punch of that, right? It's easy to read something like that and immediately take yourself off the hook and not meditate on it at all. I don't want to crush you either, but it is the kind of thing you ought to think about. Do you and your spouse argue about money? Do you, do you find it hard uh, to, 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 to donate to something that's a, that you know is to be a good cause, but, 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 you're, but you just can't hardly bring yourself to give towards it because you, you're afraid you might need that money for something you want more? I mean, do, do you find yourself constantly struggling uh, to work through a budget because there's always something that you can't really afford but that you just have to have now? I mean, all these things, if you don't watch out, money and the love of money can, can take you a lot of places. And some people, eager for money, it says, have wandered from the faith. I mean, being so hungry about cash and so hungry about stuff and so hungry about things, they've walked away from it. And this is an interesting uh, deal, too. It would seem like, if I wasn't digging too deep into this, that the more a person had... Well, they'd be more comfortable, right? They'd be more secure, and, and you would think that a comfortable, secure person would find it easier to get into faith. But that doesn't seem to be the tone that Paul's saying here. Again, it's not saying that money by itself is the risk, but money has a hook in it. And if you don't watch out, the love of that can blind you to the hook. And if you don't watch out, you can... Here's what I find, and, I've, and, and you're free to disagree. I'm not sure that I'm right. It's just what I've seen anecdotally in, in my life. I would expect that a person who has quite a bit of money would be more generous, would be more graceful, would be, would be more kind. They'd be more brave about the future. I mean, a person who had a lot of money wouldn't be worried about, about little things. Or they wouldn't be. They, they, they'd be less stressed, I would think. But I don't find that to be true. It seems like just because a person has money, sometimes people with a lot of money become more introverted and their circle of friends gets smaller and smaller. They're not wide open to get to know everybody because they think that everybody just wants something. Everybody just wants a piece of what they have. Uh, they, they get closed-minded about being generous. They, 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 they want to kind of keep it. They're skeptical of other people. Oh, they just want your money. They don't, they don't love you. They just after your cash. And sometimes a person can have all sorts of money and be more fearful about the future. You know, worried about what the stock market's doing or worried about how their assets are holding up or worried about whether they're going to have enough to do whatever they think they need to do tomorrow. Paul says, just be careful about that. He says, you, man of God, you flee from all that and pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and endurance. He says, fight the good fight of faith and hold on to the eternal life to which you were called uh, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Just one uh, quick thing here. Later in the deal, he says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or put their hope in wealth. That's uncertain. 
Put your hope in God who richly provides for us everything for our enjoyment and command them to do good and be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. This is the solution, right? Is it easier for you to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, or do you find yourself getting more and more and more isolated and withdrawn? Are you more open or less? That's what money takes from you, so pay attention to it. And if you find that there might be some things that aren't quite what you want to be, well, then push yourself a little bit. Uh, find some place to give and serve and do it this week. Uh, volunteer for something, whether at church or, or in the community. Push yourself out there a little bit and not trying to get something for yourself, but because you know it's the right thing to do. Budget some of your money. It's just going to give away to good things. I, I think a 10% mark is a great place to start, but you start wherever you have to start and continue to push yourself further. And if you've done 10% for a lot of years, maybe push yourself up a little bit there too. And practice impulsive kindness. You know, impulsive generosity. You see a need and, and you just respond to it. The same way you would if you saw that shirt you really wanted, or the same way you would if, if your friends were all going to a restaurant. You know, it's nothing maybe for you to drop a lot of money in a hurry without thinking, but when it comes to generous things, sometimes we get real guarded. Practice being a little less guarded. And if you do those things, God will take your generosity and he will continue to build into you the kind of person that you really want to become.